First, let me get us going here and um, introduce Garrett Graff, who many of you have already had a chance to meet uh, during the reception. Garrett is uh, the editor of Washingtonian Magazine, one of the youngest editors of a major magazine in the United States in keeping with our millennials theme. Uh, he's also one of the nation's leading experts on technology and politics, and that comes out of his own history, uh, which I'm sure he'll share with us, uh, working uh, as a webmaster for former Governor uh, Howard Dean around the times of his runs for the presidency. Uh, Garrett is also the first blogger to ever have been accredited to cover a White House press conference. What year was that? 2005. 2005, okay, ancient a history. A thousand years ago in blogging <laughs> Ancient time. history. Um, he uh, has written two books uh, to date. One that grew out of his experience uh, uh, on, that, uh, on the campaign trail working with the internet entitled The First Campaign, Globalization, the Web, and the Race for the White House. Um, that was focused on the 2008 presidential race. And his most recent book is entitled The Threat Matrix, uh, the FBI at War in the Age of Global Terror, which traces the history of the FBI since the death of J. Edgar Hoover. Have you seen the movie, the Leo I DiCaprio? Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, a, a factually inaccurate <laughs> movie <laughs> of sort of stunningly odd cho uh, Choice editorial of choices. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so your, your book, uh, Kirk has named it as one of the best nonfiction books of 2011. And, and then we've got up here three of our fellows who don't really need uh, introductions at this point. Abigail, Zinia, and Zach will provide some uh, reactions maybe to, to some of the things, some of the points that uh, Garrett raises, but also some of their own reflections based on the survey, the online conversation, and what we've discussed so far today. So Garrett, thanks so much for being here. I'll come up after you've had a chance to speak I don't think I'll have to do much by way of facilitation. We've always had a lot of hands flying today. Uh, so we'll have a more in com informal conversation involving everyone until about a uh, quarter of. So Garrett, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm also a uh, Georgetown uh, adjunct faculty. I teach in the journalism and communications program here. So it's always great to be uh, on campus uh, here. and. Uh, uh, always actually uh, particularly nice to be talking to an audience uh, younger than I am. Uh, so I, uh, I, I am the leading edge of this uh, generation, um, which I think everyone has a different, slightly different uh, definition of, but the one that I have settled on for, uh, for the, my writing and, and, and research on this topic is sort of the millennials, basically people born between 1979 and 1999. Um, and as I'm sure someone has already mentioned, the largest generation in US history, um, a, actually a good bit larger than the baby boomers uh, as they are coming into uh, now the voting age population. Uh, so I wanted to provide a little bit of uh, an intellectual framework to think about the millennial generation for you tonight. Um, because one of the things that, as I've been studying and following and, and, and working in this intersection of technology and politics uh, for um, basically the last decade now, uh, since the uh, almost exactly the day that I graduated uh, college, uh, I, I've come to understand a couple of things. And, and the big one is, that we are living at an era where you're seeing technological innovation meet an intellectual movement in a way that is accelerating the rise and the growth of both of them. And, and what I mean by that is we, we are living in an age where you sort of hear a lot of talk about open source technology. And I want to argue for you tonight that open source technology is not actually just a technological innovation, but that the open source movement, the idea that information is free, that it should be easily accessible, that it should be tradable, that it should be mixable, that it should be shareable, is in fact the defining intellectual movement of our age, and that it's much more than just a technology 
and it's much more than just a tool. And that I think actually much of what we are seeing play out across the world right now is this fundamental shift in an intellectual capital and intellectual movement that's forcing all institutions to make a choice between being open and being closed. Now this is something that as a movement has taken place almost entirely during our lifetimes. That I think if you look back, the, this is something that you can argue, I mean you can pick any of a, a, a thousand different starting points, but the, the one that I think historically makes the most sense is the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that you began to see at that point this, the world beginning to sort of lurch towards openness and lurch towards uh, a, a, a small d democracy and democratic principles uh, that have been accelerated dramatically over the last 10 years by the arrival of the internet and the proliferation of social media. Now, does anyone in this room, uh, have you ever heard of the Clue Train Manifesto? Does anyone? Okay, this, this is one of the things that I want you to take back and name drop on one of your professors at some point in the next couple of weeks. So the Clue Train Manifesto is the founding document of the social media movement. It was launched by a group of, uh, 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 of, of technology pioneers, um, most of whom were at uh, MIT at the time in April 1999, so about 10 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and not, I think, entirely uncoincidentally, the, the last year that generally encompasses the, the millennial generation. The Clue Train Manifesto was a document that was posted on the internet, it's still there today, cluetrain.com, that show or that laid out 95 theses. Now, what else has 95 theses? So it was modeled, of course, after Martin Luther's 95 theses that he named that he nailed to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral to launch the Protestant Reformation. Again, though, there you had an intellectual movement married with a proliferating technology that accelerated both the technology and the idea. You had Pro the Protestant Reformation meet Gutenberg's printing press, which allowed the Bible to get into the hands of ordinary people for the first time in history. Fundamentally changed the church, fundamentally changed basically all of Europe, and launched a, an entirely new age uh, for, um, uh, for politics and, and, and for intellectual history. You're seeing sort of, I think, a similar uh, aspect today where just as during the Age of Enlightenment, the, the philosophical principles there gave us both the Declaration of Independence and Mozart's music, and that the Age of Relativism gave us both Einstein's theory and Impressionism, that you're seeing these open source ideas play out in the arts, the sciences, in politics, in religion, in business, and, and in every major institution in the modern world is in some way wrestling with these questions of whether it wants to be open or shut. Fundamentally, the battle that's taking place in your pocket right now between Apple's iPhone and Google's Android operating system is a, is a conversation over open and shut. Who gets to define what gets to be on your phone? Is it Apple or is it anybody? Fundamentally, I think what you're seeing play out in, uh, in the Islamic world right now is a, is a debate over open or shut. How responsive do governments have to be to their people? How responsive does that religion have to be? Who gets to define who gets to be a Muslim? You're seeing, I think, the same thing play out in the Catholic Church today, this fundamental debate over open versus shut. Who gets to define who's Catholic? How responsive does the Catholic Church need to be to its parishioners, to, to the lay people of the faith? You're seeing this play out, of course, in politics. You're seeing it play out in business. This is a generation today that expects to have a voice. 
this is where I come back to the Clue Train Manifesto. So 95 theses. The first thesis is the only one that you really need to know. I, 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 in the class that I teach at Georgetown, we spend basically the entire first class talking just about the Clue Train Manifesto. And uh, one of the things that I have the class do is we break down how many different ideas are in the Clue Train Manifesto. The only wrong number is 95. Uh, but I think there's really only one. And that's the first thesis of the Clue Train Manifesto. Markets are conversations. So what the Clue Train Manifesto argues, what the, the people who pioneered this as a movement on the internet say, is that everything has to be responsive to us. That, what you, that we have to be able to engage institutions in a two-way conversation. That this is fundamentally what marks the difference between the internet world and the broadcast era. Is that TV was never, before the internet at least, two-way conversation. Walter Cronkite came on, he delivered the news. There wasn't a whole lot of talking back to Walter Cronkite. There wasn't a lot of tweets going back and forth debating what Walter Cronkite was saying. Walter Cronkite finished every, uh, every newscast with, and that's the way it is. Because in Walter Cronkite's day, the way that Walter Cronkite told you it was, was the way that it was. And that it wasn't open for conversation. And so now today, though, TV is interactive. More people will vote in, uh, well, may, maybe not now, but uh, historically, more people will vote for the winner of American Idol than will vote for the presidency in, uh, in a month. And that, so we're seeing this fundamentally shift the way that we believe that we're supposed to interact with institutions. You all are growing up in a time where you expect to be able to go on the internet and reach and talk to your elected officials, uh, Delta Airlines when you, your flight gets canceled, uh, Zappos when your shoes don't arrive on time, that sort of everyone is supposed to be responsive to you. And fundamentally, everything now is supposed to be a conversation. And what I think you are beginning to see this play out uh, over the last year and a half in the Arab world, that uh, fundamentally all of, these all of these revolutions, all of these uh, political debates across uh, the Arab Spring are conversations and debates and revolutions around open and shut. What's going to be open? What's going to be shut? And the correct answer in all of these is not open. The, the world is trending, obviously, in the direction of openness, but not every government is going to end there. Not every business is going to end there. Apple, obviously, has created a fundamentally transformative technology and transformative company, the richest company in the history of the world, uh, with an entirely closed ecosystem. Apple offers nothing that Apple doesn't want to offer. There's no conversation with Apple, and Apple makes no mistakes. And that this, was the, this is the way that they have built their business, and it is the fundamental intellectual underpinning of their company. So it, this is not a case where every single thing has to become open, but we are seeing that the burden has shifted over the last 20 years, that the default now has to be open, and you have to be making conscious choices to keep things closed, to keep debates closed, to keep conversations closed in a way that was not the default 20, 30, 40 years ago. So I think that this is going to be something that affects the millennial generation in big ways and small ways, uh, probably for our entire lifetime. That this is going to be uh, an intellectual debate and an intellectual discussion that is going to guide and drive most of our life and our relationship with uh, institutions uh, of faith, institutions of politics, institutions of business, uh, and fundamentally uh, shape all of the rest of our lives. Uh, and, and I think is uh, a, a truly exciting time to be a part of this because 
there are not, not every generation gets to be part of an intellectual revolution. And we talk a lot about the technological revolutions that are taking place in our lives, uh, which are tremendous, and we might get into some of those uh, over the next 45 minutes or so. But in, in my mind, the really exciting thing is that we have an intellectual movement and an intellectual revolution that's underpinning and accelerating the technological change in our daily lives. So I think I might leave it there, uh, and I don't know whether I'm supposed to well, introduce let's, let's the... Let's applaud each of the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so Abigail, I'll pass it along to you. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, so the, the theme tonight seems to be millennials and technology, and obviously this is something that's surrounded by a lot of opinions, both good and bad. And earlier today, we heard at the survey release from Laura Sessions Step about the idea, which was also mentioned at the Millennial Mayor's event, uh, that technology and the internet is our generation's village square, a place to have a civil discussion of our ideas. Um, and it would be wonderful if that were how uh, political discourse works online. Uh, however, there are lots of examples to contradict this idea as well. Uh, you only have to look in the comment section of any news article uh, or a controversial video to see the vitriol and um, anger that lurk in the anonymity of the internet. Uh, people use inflammatory remarks as a kind of currency uh, to buy discord. <laughs> Uh, even in forums where participants know each other, uh, civil discourse is hard to find. Being from South Carolina, deep in the Bible Belt, and going to college now in Boston, I have quite a mix of conservatives and liberals among my Facebook friends. Uh, and I've pretty much given up on the idea of posting anything political because of the senseless comment wars that people get into on my Facebook page. People call each other names, stereotypes are brought up, and civility is pretty distant. And this is frustrating because the internet can be useful and important, but like any tool, it's all about how you employ it. Uh, technology can give us access to news, enough information to win every trivia round that we ever would want to, uh, but many don't take advantage of that. For example, Twitter. Any of the fellows who have talked to me here know about my addiction to Twitter. Uh, I, and I use it to follow news and different organizations whose work I'm interested in, but a friend of mine uses it to follow only Korean celebrities. Uh, she's a big fan of K-pop. And <laughs> my dad uses it to follow his favorite baseball players. Uh, this is the platform that enabled political change and revolution around the world, but it is also home to senseless tweets and legions of Justin Bieber fans. And even for those who want to use technology in a useful way, their considerations, it's very easy for the internet to become an echo chamber for your own opinions a place where the content that you see and the news is so filtered that every time you open your laptop, you're just seeing things that you already agree with. Uh, these are the dangers and challenges of technology for our generation and for really everyone who uses technology now. Uh, but even with all these challenges and problems, I'm still a huge proponent of using social media and the internet, and it's because it's humanizing. Uh, I know people, especially older generations, like to bemoan the lack of face-to-face -face contact that happens when people conduct communication online, but communication, the instant messages, the tweets, the blog posts, allow us to engage with people around the world, uh, people who are different than us, yet also share so many things. You can identify with the young activists of the Middle East, journalists in China, students in India. Uh, we can Instagram and tweet and blog our thoughts and our hopes and our fears, 
for the world that we all share. Um, studies show that contact with the other, uh, be it LGBT or Muslims or any other different demographic, uh, has a huge impact on a person's acceptance of that demographic. Uh, this is the beauty and the challenge of technology. Can we use it to bring ourselves closer together uh, instead of dividing us further apart? And now, Xenia. <laughs> Hello. Thank you both so much for what you've said. It's, it's interesting to see two such different perspectives. One looking at the internet as the source of an intellectual revolution and the source of open space. And then at the same time with that open space, as Abigail mentioned, comes so much danger, so much fear of misuse. And I think what I'm going to try and do, uh, at least in my remarks, is bring that into the survey and see what else we can use the internet for that perhaps doesn't have those risks. So, just to share a brief story with you, um, last week I was walking by a voter registration booth. They're set up all over campus right now, as I'm sure all of you know. And you know, it was manned by two extremely peppy 20-somethings going, register to vote, register to vote, you, 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 register to vote. As the good millennial I am coming to this conference, I had registered several weeks ago. So you know, I did the polite nod and sort of kept walking by. But this girl behind me, who I'm sure older people in this audience would assume is, you know, angstily or punk-like dressed, like turned around with a look of scorn and said, bite me, like my vote is going to count for anything. So it was pretty interesting. And that's sort of what we see in, in the very title of the survey today, diverse, disillusioned, and divided. It seems like millennials have lost a lot of faith in the institutions that govern this country and the political process that we follow. I mean, just to look at the survey results, 63% of millennials say that people like them don't have any say about what the government does. 13% are apathetic because they say that their vote just doesn't matter. And 86% see government as the government, not our government. And that's something we've talked about a lot today. And really, who can blame our generation for feeling that way, is what I kind of think. I mean, in the last three months alone, political dialogue has been so inflamed and so ad hominem, and even in yesterday's debates, it was a little boring at times. I mean, how are we supposed to balance that? So from, you know, Scott Brown trying to dissect Elizabeth Warren's ethnicity to Todd Akin's truly deplorable comments about legitimate rape to, you know, wondering whether Citizens United means that there will be three people who have essentially bought a campaign. I mean... Millennials have a lot to be disillusioned about. When I go to the polls next month for the very first time in my life, I'm not sure if my vote is really going to count for anything. But what I am sure about is that our generation is the one that can make our vote count for something. We are an immensely capable and energetic generation, as Hira said this morning. Speaker after speaker, today and even the two of you have noted exactly what kind of tools we have when we look at the internet. And I think that with technology, we can stimulate some kind of dialogue and discussion. So what I'm trying to say is that this generation has the tools, the utility belt essentially with technology and with the internet, from an iPhone app that can tell you what super PAC is funding an ad that you see on your television screen, to of course, Gang the Gangnam Style parody, Mitt Romney. I mean, our generation really does have the equipment. We just need to figure out what we want to do with it. And I think that that starts with a long, hard look at how this generation identifies itself, what our political, philosophical, and religious views really are, where our morality comes from. People in this room might not think that that's a real issue. People might think that they've got it all figured out. But the truth is that we breathe very stratified university air, where you know, we have ethical reasoning requirements and things that we have to do in philosophy. But I just wanted to read you guys something I read last week um, from Christian Smith's new book, Lost in Translation, The Dark Side of Emerging Adulthood. It sounds terrifying, but to be fully honest, it is. Um, when asked to describe his moral perspective, one of the subjects said, I just don't know. Like, it's not like I'm ever, like, because right and wrong. I mean, there just could be, like... I guess I don't think about my decisions in terms of morality. <laughs> He's a champion. Um, 
The truth is, I think our generation still has a long way to go. And I think that technology is going to be key. We do have open spaces. And we do have ways in which we can start and stimulate dialogue. In addition to you know, informal chats, to internet discussions, or you know, well-planned symposiums, symposia, I think that what's important is we need to have older generations give us the kind of vocabulary and mor moral language that we need to figure out what this generation is really all about. I mean, do we still believe in affirmative action? Does race, gender, and sexuality still create divides in our country? Would we be okay with a Muslim or a Mormon or an atheist or a Zoroastrian president? I don't know, but I think what the internet can do and technology can do is bring us all together when we're making those decisions. And as a unifying concept, or if the internet can be a concept, I think if we make those decisions together about what we believe, then there really is no wrong choice. So thank you. And this is Zach. <laughs> well, Mr. Graff, thank you for making it out here this evening. It was a pleasure getting to sit down with you and talk some debate and uh, politics with you. Um, going at the end here, um, the theme you set up in the beginning was technology meets social movement. Technology, a, a shifting infrastructure, technology plus politics. And then there was a range here of why it's good and why it's bad. Uh, and one of the conversations that came up after the release of the survey was, is the hype over the internet as a social movement beneficial for democracy legitimate? Um, or is, are there major deficiencies in the internet that are actually detrimental to democracy? Um, one of the fellows mentioned a, an interesting book I haven't read yet, I think I will. Uh, but for the time being here, uh, I'll look to make a couple of brief points about why the internet is, as a social movement um, producing or could produce positive democracy, and then a few, um, a few suggestions on how it could do so better. Um, I think on a national level, we see ambassadors from all over the world who are now using Twitter to submit 140 um, character messages to the world. And I think the United States Department of State is doing an exemplary job uh, in developing 21st century statecraft, which they understand to be a, um, a is based on Lost um, their um, their their director of innovation worked heavily on the Obama campaign, and he shifted into the State Department, and he's been a huge factor in developing um, the State Department's model of, of digital diplomacy, and he uh, makes some great points over a very long period of time. Uh, one thing that he mentions is that the digital age, this technology shift, is matching global shifts in the sense we are seeing hierarchical changes. We're seeing changes that occur from the bottom up versus the top down. And technology in the form of social media slash social movement is facilitating uh, this, this shift from top down to, to bottom up. Uh, another, another good instance of why the internet uh, is, or why the social media movement is good for democracy in creating change is that it matches most of the successful social movements toward change of the past. We think of Mahatma Gandhi, we think of Martin Luther King, and we tend to associate positive social movements with leaders. When actually, you look back, there were very few successful movements that were headed by one man or one woman or a leader. Most great social movements towards social change were leaderless. I think it goes against our conceptualization of what it takes to make change. But change has usually been um, a mass effort, often um, by more than one person. Um, and Doug McAdam from Stanford, um, who studies uh, activists and movements, uh, mentioned that this is one thing that Occupy Wall Street demonstrates. I don't know how we can judge its success or not, but it was a movement that was generally leaderless. When Alec Ross, um, was talking to someone who was involved with the social media movement in the Middle East for Arab Spring. And Alec Ross said, you know, complimenting him, you did a great job leading this. This was a fantastic effort. And the gentleman said, no, I wasn't a leader. The network was a leader. Uh, and that he was using Twitter and YouTube and Facebook, but the network was the true leader of that. 
So those are a couple of things that I believe are the links between technology plus social movement and democracy. And there are five things that are key that we need to make sure um, remains in that village square, in that uh, public square. Things that are towards catalyzing social media to be a social movement, technology that will catalyze democracy. There's a uh, Canadian activist and social theorist, I think his name is Ian Adam, you might have to check, uh, check me on that first name is right. And he put together a work recently that said um, democracy requires five major things. Uh, a public that is unified by a common easily accessible. I feel like I'm feeding in. Can everybody hear me when I Is this better? Is it consistent? Do I get to hold the mic? Okay, I'm sometimes more comfortable doing that anyway. Thank you. It's done, but for technology to produce social medium and social um, um, movements that create an effective democracy, uh, it needs to remain a, a public space. Um, one of, my con one of my concerns automatically when one of the speakers earlier uh, at the survey release said um, maybe it's not Facebook is that going outside the mainstream has proven a little bit difficult in some ways. I believe Facebook will remain for at least a little while longer the most tangible and, and large scale public space that we'll see that we'll have for the next few years. Uh, the second is does it maintain, produce, sustain, promote a civic identity. Um, one of the fellows or maybe one of um, the professors we were with mentioned that by having I voted on Facebook that polls have shown that friends who viewed that one of their friends voted on Facebook were more likely to vote. Um, so does our public space, does our social media um, produce a civic identity? Thirdly, does it promote self-governance? Um, does it maintain a bottom-up uh, governance idea? Uh, fourthly, is it, inf is it informative? And is it informative through, fifthly, an easily accessible fact base? Uh, and I believe the internet uh, provides that. And I think if the internet continues to remain those five things, this new shift in infrastructure towards a more open world that is based around online and internet social media and social awareness and social movements will continue to be a positive direction towards producing democracy that we've seen um, emphasized by Arab Spring, but I think continuing to move forward. So those were just a few thoughts that I had. Again, thank you for your thoughts on that. Right. Okay, I think um, starting with Garrett's uh, Fascinating presentation. I never thought of it quite that way, and I've lived through all of that before and after. Uh, but this notion that open versus closed is the new kind of dichotomy or the new way of structuring institutions and thinking about them was fascinating. You seem to be optimistic about those, those potentials, although the Apple example uh, shows us that closed systems have a lot of power. Um, and I thought Zach uh, and Xenia on balance were, were optimistic about the potentials for this technology, and we have the metaphor of a kind of virtual public square. Um, but Abigail really also struck some fascinating chords with her, her story about her own Facebook, basically having to shut down and away debate among her friends on her own Facebook page, uh, showing that you know, familiarity with, with someone and presumably um, the, all these people care about you to some degree. Or do you have like 3,000 friends there? <laughs> Is it sort of they're, undifferentiated? They're only around like 600. <laughs> okay, 600, that's nothing, all right, from what I understand. Um, a fascinating story about how an open space, even linked back to a person that people have a bond with, can t degenerate um, the way you describe. So lots of interesting issues. Um, I want to throw it open, and you can ask questions, maybe especially of, of Garrett or the other panelists, but as we've done throughout the day, let's try to get as many different perspectives, um, responses, different angles on this, particularly if there are things that haven't been said, um, angles that occur to you that you think would help fill out the, the conversation of new technology, social media, and democracy. Do we have a, a mic? Yes, okay, look at this table over here. We might as well just pass the mic around. 
the fellows table here up front. Yeah. And, and uh, for Garrett's benefit, just uh, mention your name and where, where you're from. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Graff. My name is Ryan Price, and I attend Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. And I have, I have a, a lot of questions about the markets are conversations idea and, and the many different uh, effects that might have. But I, I am mostly curious about uh, what predictions you might have for what internet, social media, and new technology are going to do for your industry specifically. Um, people today are referring to, um, I'm a little hesitant to say it, but they're referring to newspapers as dinosaurs and going out of business and everyone's predicting their, their downfall and their demise. And, um, and with, with the advent of the Nook and the Kindle and the iPad, people think uh, paper books are going to disappear as well. And there's, there's a lot of predictions of uh, the way we do journalism in the United States uh, radically changing. And so do you have any predictions for what, what might actually occur in the coming years and what effects that might have on American democracy? Uh, so it, it, it is a subject that I spend a lot of every day of my life thinking about, uh, a, a, as one might imagine. Um, I, I was saying earlier, my, I've been at the magazine now for seven years, four years as an editor and writer, and three years now as the editor. Uh, and when I came to the magazine, we, start, we, we had one platform. We, we were not actually a media company. We were a medium company. We put out a monthly print magazine once a month. Uh, and uh, that was seven years ago. And that was seven years. You didn't ago. have a website. No. We had a website, but there was not original content Got it. Okay. for for the website. It was just a uh, effectively carbon copy of the the magazine. And we uh, now, in a given year, publish and program across uh, sixteen different platforms, of which the magazine is just one. Uh, and it's been a tremendous change for us. Uh, the biggest bit of which uh, comes in twofold. One, uh, it has tremendously changed the conversations that we have back and forth with our readers uh, and, and our subscribers. Um, and secondly, uh, has brought us a lot more readers. Um, we, we have about 400,000 monthly print readers, which is a, roughly the same number that we had uh, uh, seven years ago, um, but we now have a million monthly web readers, uh, which is about a million more than we had uh, <laughs> seven years ago. But to your question about the, the predictions, I, I, this, this is actually an area that I'm deeply concerned about. I'm generally pretty optimistic about technology, uh, but uh, I am, uh, pretty worried about where we are heading in terms of media consumption. And, and the reason that I say that is I think we are seeing a split right now in media consumption between uh, what I uh, call either media for the elites and media for the non-elites, or sort of more pejoratively, media for rich people and media for poor people. And what you are seeing is that there is a huge market for high quality content for business purposes. If you look at the media companies that are doing the best in the United States right now, it is high price point uh, media geared toward business people. Uh, Bloomberg, the Wall Street Journal, uh, Bloomberg Business Week, uh, the, the Economist, the Financial Times. Uh, these are, uh, Bloomberg costs $20,000 a year for a subscriber. Uh, Wall Street Journal is about $600 a year. Uh, and that these are media that are being paid for, for the most part, by businesses for their employees. And the reason that they're paying for it is, uh, how many people here have taken an economics class of some kind? Uh, so you're familiar with arbitrage, loosely, anyone? Arbitrage opportunities? Okay, someone. Uh, so uh, an arbitrage opportunity is basically a place where you can make money, simply put. Uh, and access to better quality information than the person next to you 
is an arbitrage opportunity. If you understand the world better, if you understand politics better, if you understand geopolitics better, if you understand technology better, anything like that, it's a great opportunity to make money. So, the, so business is willing to pay for their employees to have access to high quality, accurate, highly vetted information because they understand that they can make more money than it costs to subscribe. So Bloomberg can charge $20,000 for access to one of its stock terminals because getting that for a trader is going to allow that trader to make a lot more than $20,000 a year for you as, uh, as a company. So the challenge is that information is incredibly accurate, incredibly up-to-date, and incredibly predictive. Non-elites, though, have less access to high quality information than they did 10, 15, 20 years ago when local newspapers were great, when, uh, when you saw wire services have a, a broad access to the world that was carried forward in, in local newspapers, uh, and, and when broadcast news was really focused on providing uh, not just profit, but access to public information. And so you have seen sort of the collapse of the economy that provided high quality information to ordinary people uh, in terms of Time, Newsweek, US News and World Report, your daily newspaper. And what I worry about is that this is, this is an incredibly bad trend for democracy, for a group of people to have access to better information than other citizens. And for, uh, so if you use the internet wisely, you can get better information than the President of the United States was able to access 35 years ago. Most people are not particularly good at using the internet. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I sort of say that jokingly, but it's not actually that much of a joke. Um, and, and, and this is, uh, um, I'm not going to, uh, judge your friends one way or another. Uh, but sort of one of the challenges is that uh, millennials in many ways don't seek out news in the way that prior generations did. And that they sort of wait for news to come to them through Facebook or through Twitter. Which works well if you are smart about how that news gets to you. And works pretty poorly if you're not because you end up with a ton of Justin Bieber news uh, and a ton of Kardashian news, which is fascinating, but has very little to do with the Euro. <laughs> and so I think that the, the worry that I have is that we're going to, if you fast forward 10, 15, 20 years from now, you're going to end up with a chunk of the population that has really stunningly good access to amazing information uh, that allows them to make decisions that, al that, uh, that either help them make more money or keep the money that they have. And that the vast majority of the population loses access to timely, quality, vetted information uh, unless they are really, really dedicated to searching it out. And that's not just uh, a lack of information that affects the bottom line in business or consumer decisions, but in general, knowledge of current affairs, political literacy, all of those things? Or? Well, it, it, it's that. It's also uh, a watchdog role that's disappearing, which is the local newspapers, uh, and it, you know, I'm sorry that the, the two mayors weren't here to be part of this conversation, yeah. uh, but that sort of one of the things that local newspapers did was they showed up at city council meetings. And uh, so for uh, using my personal experience here, so in 2005, I was the first blogger accredited to cover a White House press briefing. Seven years later, uh, do you know how many unpaid bloggers are currently covering the White House? Zero. And, and that's because if you're not paid to show up and sit through these things, for the most part, they're pretty boring. And if you're not paid to do it, most people can't afford to take the time to do it anyway, even if you're really interested. Uh, and, 
and, and if that's true at the White House level, that's definitely true at your local school board level, your local city council level, your sewer commission meeting, your airports authority meeting, sort of all of these things that's, that local newspapers are responsible for doing. Because we, you know, we obviously, we elect officials and that's part of our democracy, but then theoretically, you're supposed to have this fourth estate, the, the press, who sort of show up and at our best, and I'm not saying that this is something that we did 100% of the time, but at our best, the, the press represents a check on established power. Um, and that it's sort of someone who's supposed to read through the annual report and making sure that the mayor and the city councilor aren't just sort of handing out all of the money to their friends. Um, or at least that their friends are competent. If they are handing out all of the money to their friends, their friends are competent. And, and if no one is showing up to the city council meetings anymore, that's not something that bloggers are gonna end up doing. That's not something that people are going to end up sort of volunteering to do where you're like, oh, hey buddy, uh, I'll take care of sitting through all the school board meetings if you'll take care of sitting through all the city council meetings and uh, actually you, you can take the sewer commission. Um, that's just not, never going to happen. And so I think that what I worry about is that you end up basically with a media that only has business interests at heart uh, and allows for um, you know, a effectively a kleptocracy in a way that uh, we have been able to, with a hundred years of activist journalism dating back to the Gilded Age, been able to maneuver away from uh, in a way that you know, we've sort of gotten used to uh, and that that's an era that may not continue over the next 15 or 20 years. Okay, uh, let's gather maybe a couple of comments, Tyler or, and then Bryce. And, yeah. um, so we've heard a lot, oh sorry, um, I'm Tyler and I attend Vanderbilt in Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, so we've heard a lot about how internet and social media have influenced conversation and kind of motivated civic action, but what about its role in actually facilitating physical political action? Um, with our current in infrastructure, I don't see why it's entirely unreasonable to assume that we may be headed into, in a direction to where we may be interacting with government through the internet, um, more, th more so than now and in the next few years. So um, personally, I see some benefits of that, um, such as engaging millennials, such as, um, you know, getting more civic action, as we've referenced already. But um, also, I see some problems with that. Obviously, there might be some with infrastructure, getting that system on its feet. But um, what are your thoughts on um, using the internet and other technologies in facilitating actual political action? OK, Bryce? I'm, hello? Oh, there we go. Um, I'm Bryce Ezell from George Fox University in Portland, Oregon. and. Um, my question is about generational divide, like what we're experiencing right now. And it's interesting because everything you talked about kind of culminated in this one television program over the summer called The Newsroom. And it's written by Aaron Sorkin, a professed liberal, who ends up coming to a very conservative conclusion because he ends up arguing that we should be a, back in the era of Cronkite and Murrow. That's like his thesis. And the lead character, who's kind of his mouthpiece, in the first five minutes of the show yells at a college student for... Asking, and he ends up calling the millennial generation the worst period, generation, period, ever, period. And so he's obviously got this cynicism. And one of the episodes is devoted to exactly what Abigail talked about, which is online anonymity, and that there's no real conversations happening because people can hide behind some trolley name and be able to say whatever they want to. And I guess my question is, like, I write for an online magazine that allows comment sections, and there's been discussions amongst my fellow writers about whether or not that's productive, because some magazines like mine don't have them, and they seem to be better off for it. And But that comment sections, while I recognize there are problems like Abigail does, I don't see them as inherently evil. But for people like Sorkin, who are used to a, a more, you know, 
a type of news where it's headed by one, you know, visionary man type person, um, that seems inherently bad. So how is it that we could possibly bridge the concerns that the older generation has with our new ideas? Because I think that we should be able to do that. I don't think we should just have to like wait for the old generation to die off and then we replace them. So I feel like there's got to be some way to like bridge... <laughs> I feel like there's got to be a way to bridge that conversation without entirely undermining their beliefs and or sacrificing ours. Um, so I'll tie both of those together in a re what I hope is a relatively short answer uh, so that we can <laughs> keep talking. Uh, the internet is what you make of it, is, is the sort of the fundamental challenge. The internet, social media, Twitter, Facebook, all of these things are neutral tools. They can be used for good and for evil. Uh, Barack Obama was elected in 2008 by the internet and by millennials. Uh, I am uh, I'm happy at a, a different point to give you the long thesis if you don't believe that, uh, but it's true. Uh, and the, the, it, it's not that Obama, uh, that the internet was solely responsible for the election of Barack Obama. It was that Barack Obama could not have been elected without the internet. Same thing with uh, the Arab Spring. The, it is not that Tunisia or Egypt or Libya or Syria or any of these things as they're playing out are the Twitter revolution. That a bunch of people got on Twitter, wrote really, really angry things, and then the governments collapsed. It's <laughs> that none of these revolutions could have happened without Twitter without the social media, without the technology that underpinned and accelerated uh, and, and enabled them. So the challenge of all of this is it's really easy to be really lazy on the internet. And uh, I think that the worry that I have with uh, the millennial generation, which has actually not been borne out thus, because I think that there are interesting examples of how the millennials, particularly with the Obama campaign in 2008, did turn uh, online interest into offline action. But that liking something on Facebook or retweeting, retweeting something on Twitter does not count as action. And that that's not a, um, that's not a replacement for actually voting, actually donating to a campaign, actually phone banking, actually knocking on doors. And that I think you, uh, the, the sort of worst example of this uh, this year uh, was the Coney 2012 video, where people were like, no, dude, I totally watched that. I'm all <laughs> up on that now. <laughs> and there was almost no like actual activity that, and, and leaving aside all of the uh, pretty legitimate complaints about the, the underlying uh, facts of that movie. Um, that, that was sort of the, the best and clearest example I've seen of something that like really raised, raised awareness, but then like, so what? Um, and, and I think that that's the, the fundamental challenge in this, is ensuring that you don't accept the laziness that the internet encourages. Uh, now, that being said, uh, I do think it's interesting that you sort of point out this thing about the generations dying off, because uh, one of the most interesting things in political science is that generational groups effectively never change their voting patterns. The number of people who wake up in their 40s and change the party that they're voting for is, uh, is not zero, but pretty close to zero. And that in the last 80 years, all of the shifts in parties uh, in the political process of Republican to Democrat, Democrat uh, and, and back, uh, are because generations die off and new generations come in. And that all of the political science shows that once a voter votes for the same party for president three times in a row, they will effectively never change the party that they vote for. And one of the things that's really interesting in, to see as the greatest generation ages out and baby boomers begin to retire is the way that the millennial generation is beginning to lock in Democratic. 
that you have uh, a generation that began voting with Gore, uh, then voted for Kerry, then voted for Obama, and is about to vote for Obama again, and not by small numbers. That, uh, um, that j basically the only thing that made John Kerry competitive in 2004 was the millennials. He lost every other age bracket except for the millennials. Uh, and in 2008, won by such a smashing margin that effectively, if everything had stayed the same from 2004 to 2008, which it didn't, but if everything had and the millennials had just voted at the rate that they did, Barack Obama would have won. And that's the, the area that Mitt Romney has never made an inroad into this time around, which actually the survey today shows uh, and bears out that, that is, uh, that's a fundamental uh, structural problem that the Republican Party might take a generation to overcome.